Hello, welcome. Thank you very much for, for being here at uh, today's talk. We're focusing here on audio, and uh, it's, it's a critical aspect to all of, uh, of the media that we consume, and uh, that's why we're taking a, a deep look. And uh, we invite everybody to contribute at the end. And in, in the meantime, I'm going to talk to our panelists, and we're going to discuss the way that um, audio has changed in the past and, uh, and going forward. So I'd like to um, say thank you for being here. And uh, this is part of uh, a range of talks that happen every year at IBC, put on by the Institution of Engineering and Technology, which is a, uh, a global UK-based uh, professional organization. And it's very much focused on engineering as uh, its core. And it's really important to bring together all aspects across engineering from uh, all ways of life, uh, whether it's power, whether it's uh, media, um, and uh, all of the things in between. We've got to increasingly work together to make sure that uh, diversity is, is seen in all aspects um, of our lives, and also to make sure that we make uh, strive, uh, striving motions forward in sustainability and, uh, and other aspects, because uh, only working together can we do that. So part of uh, our role at, at IET um, is to promote uh, IBC as a, as a conference, but also the conversations within. And uh, as much as we're going to focus on technology and audio today, it's part of a wider uh, discussion uh, about uh, the importance of moving ourselves forward as, as, a, as humans to make sure that we have a better world. So um, my name is Russell Trafford-Jones, and I'm uh, the chair of IET Media Technical Network. I'm very pleased to be joined uh, by the panelists today. Uh, I'm going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves, give us a quick understanding, because what we've done is brought together a wide range of experiences and, and knowledge so that we can uh, talk about audio in, um, in, uh, with a range of experience. So first of all, I'm very pleased to be joined by Anne. How are you doing today? Good. It's lovely to see so many people here. So, yeah. Thank you for being here. Um, we'd like to just give us a, a, a moment to an, in, give us an insight into what you've been up to my, over, over these years. My weird and wonderful background. <laughs> uh, so hello, um, my name's Anne and I have a, a nice mixture, I hope, of, of things in my background. So I was a radio and online producer for many years and then an uh, entertaining career swivel, I became a broadcast engineer specialising in audio edit and play out. So I spent 12 years at the BBC I was lucky to work on the two largest projects that the BBC had ever done, which was the uh, W1 programme, so Rebuilding Broadcasting House, which is the BBC's headquarters, and also Project North, which was building a second headquarters in Salford in the north of England. Um, so it's the two largest projects the BBC had ever done, and uh, we did those at the same time with the same people, so that was quite tiring. Um, so then 10 years ago or so, I uh, left the BBC, and then I have worked in New Zealand um, training journalists, and then I was very lucky to work in South Sudan, training broadcast engineers and journalists. And uh, I also now work all over the world with anyone who will pay me to do interesting projects in the radio and audio space. And I'm also one of the organizers of the Radio TechCon conference, which happens in London, the 27th of November this year in London. And uh, the IET is one of our supporters. So yes, a nice mixture of things, but I'm particularly passionate about object-based media and I have a plan to get us to start using object-based media in the real world, but I'm sure we'll come to that. Indeed. And uh, Daniela, hello. Thank Hi. you for being here. Um, tell us a little bit about your, your background and your interests. Hi, um, my name is Daniela. I work as a sound engineer, and I guess here on the panel, I am the one with the least amount of work experience, which is <laughs> why I'm very happy to uh, join you guys. Um, I work as a sound engineer, so I'm more like on the creative approach. I've started working for Fraunhofer IIS in Germany back in 2020. So it's been three years. My main focus is on object-based audio, so not media overall, but just the audio part. Um, and we work with our codec MPEG-H audio. Um, it supports immersive sound, interactive sound, and that's what, what I'm focused in. So I do produce content with immersive audio and interactive audio. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, Bruce, hello, thank you for coming here today. Pleasure, Russell. 
It's been a, it's been a busy uh, show, and uh, so pleased that you could make some time. What have you been up to at the show, and, uh, and what's your background over the last uh, years? Well, I'll, I'll start with the audio background, as this is an audio place. My first ever project at the BBC Research Department back in 1986 was an audio compression and decompression project with metadata, as we'd call it now, to try and save money on the World Service Broadcasting. And I can talk a little bit about that and what we learned about not all languages are the same when you put them over radio with those kinds of techniques. Um, Fast forward many years, and I was that MXF guy. I'm sorry, my daughter still sells the voodoo dolls with the pins if you need them. Um, <laughs> they're very good for sort of you know, getting rid of PTSD. Um, one of the most interesting things of developing the MXF file format was that we had to work very closely with the Audio Engineering Society to find a standard for broadcast wave. Because whilst everybody was using it, it was not formally written down and voted on by anyone, which we didn't realize when we started off. So that was very interesting. I'm perpetually grateful to some people from uh, NHK who helped with, with that particular process. Fast forward another few years, and I was Standards Vice President at SIMT. Um, and another Bruce, Bruce Olson, was the head of the Audio Engineering Society. And we were trying to get closer cooperation so that um, audio, particularly within SIMT, wasn't just about television, but also included you know, radio and podcasting. And we did a lot of work together on trying to harmonize different people working on things like uh, the document that became the Immersive Audio Broadcast Standard to try and harmonize Atmos and DTSX and MPEG-H and those kinds of things. And now I'm chopping up little bits of video to make funny stories about Big Buck Bunny without the bunny to try and show that true hyper-personalization is possible. And you know what? The thing we need to work on most is not the pictures. And I'm going to leave that dangling for later <laughs> because I dare say Anne will complete my punchline for me. It's <laughs> a good point. Thank you, Bruce. And um, Stefan, uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, what's your background from Fraunhofer? So I'm Stefan Mölzer, I'm working with Fraunhofer. It's my second time I'm with Fraunhofer. Uh, <clears throat> during my first time at Fraunhofer, I was involved in some radio projects. Some of you might remember World Space Satellite Radio many, many years ago, before the internet hitch. <laughs> and then afterwards, I also was involved in the XM Satellite Radio project from the technical side, where we <clears throat> did all the uh, development of the system, but also on the audio coding side. Then I joined a company called Coding Technologies, which brought high efficiency AAC to the world. And then I did a little bit of time with uh, wave field synthesis before I rejoined uh, Fraunhofer. And now I'm in charge of <coughs> business development there for audio, mainly MPEG-H nowadays. And uh, so I'm involved in standardization, DVB, ATC, and sometimes also on the radio side with Digital Radio Mondial. <coughs> so that's my short summary. <laughs> That's great, thank you. So I wanted to start by taking a little um, think back to when uh, DAB started. Um, so uh, effectively that was, seems to me at least to have been the beginning of uh, digital um, coming into the, the audio uh, world and radio specifically, I should say. Um, I wonder if perhaps Stefan, if you could perhaps comment on, um, on the, the codecs that we had available at the time and the decisions that some countries have been left with. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, effectively, you know, as, as a technology, I think we'd agree it's uh, the delivery of the radio is good. But, you know, tell us a little bit about the, the audio codec used back then. Okay, so the, the interesting part is that um, the MPEG layer two and layer three, which was later known as MP3, were all developed in one research program, which was funded by the European Union for Digital Radio. And uh, during the time when the codecs were ready, it was a big discussion using the layer two, which was developed by, by Philips and, and others, or the layer three, which later became MP3. And it was decided to use for DAB the layer two because of complexity issues. So the layer three had a higher comp uh, compression rate, but was more, a little bit more complex. So that's where layer two came into DAB and later on also in, into DVB. And for some reason, it might have been lucky for layer three because it became MP3 and the codec of the um, ISDN area, yep, <laughs> yep. first internet area, because it could do some good quality at 64 and 128 kilobits per second. And when MP3 was finalized, 
MPEG started then to have a new project called Non-Backward Compatible Audio. <laughs> and this later on became AAC. And so we have different flavors of AAC nowadays. We have the AAC Low Complexity, which is the main use profile of the AAC world. Uh, we had low delay and enhanced low delay versions for communication applications. And then <clears throat> in around 2000, the idea of the spectral band replication came up from a um, researcher in, in Sweden. So he came to this idea from a totally different angle. He did um, frequency transposition for deep sea divers for uh, oil platforms. So when, when they dive, they have to inhale helium, and so they have a Mickey Mouse voice. So to transpose the frequency back down to the normal range <coughs> makes it a lot more understandable. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's where the SBR idea was born, and it was first tried to apply to hearing aids and then to the, um, the auto coding. And this was also in the uh, context of a radio program. So it was first proposed for the Digital Radio Mondial system, because if you do short wave digitally and you only have about 20, 24 kilobits per second, you need a very efficient audio coding. So that <clears throat> was then the time where the coding technologies company was founded and developed the high efficiency AAC and all the high efficiency AAC version two, where we added a tool to make a, a parametric stereo version. So out of a mono signal with additional data, you can recreate on the receiving side a stereo signal. So <clears throat> already a lot of steps. Next, next step in the AAC is now uh, what is called XHE AAC, Extended High Efficiency AAC. And here we have a new tools in the audio coding side because one of the main problems of the um, pure audio codex, general audio codex, is the speech part. So they work very nicely on music, but in low bitrate speech is a problem. So the extended high efficiency AAC includes also a speech codec and a seamless switching between the speech and the audio codec. And with this, we can now go to very low bit rates. We can reach FM quality like 16 kilobits per second. <clears throat> and um, we also have introduced to uh, foster for the accessibility part, better understandability and so on, and uh, better user experience. Um, mandatory loudness normalization and dynamic range control. So <clears throat> this helps a lot to create a better audio for the users at the end. And these are the typical channel-based codecs and you see we uh, moved on, mono, stereo, Fifon, uh, multi-channel and immersive <clears throat> with Dolby Atmos. 5.1.2, 5.1.4 with 204 height speakers, or like the Japanese, like 22.2 with three layers. <clears throat> so this can all be done with channels. But the next step for us was <clears throat> we have reached the right good level of compression. So what would be next to have more features on the creative side? So with, with MPEG H or also AC4 in, on the Dolby side, we introduced the object based concept, which allows us now to transmit some of the mixing console to the consumer. So, <clears throat> and this gives you a lot of new creative features and Daniela can um, <clears throat> say more about this, about the creative possibilities to improve the user experience while still having a very good compression rate. So that's a short summary of. <laughs> 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 yeah, considering how much time that span, that was a very short summary, and I appreciate that. And it's, it really gives us an, an insight into the way that uh, um, that things have developed over the years. Bruce, you talked about a, um, a scheme to save money for the World Service in 1986. Yeah, how did that go? Um, it saved a lot of money. Good, <laughs> um, and it was interesting. It was if we sort of take the dumbest compressor that you can think of, which is basically I've got this little audio signal and it goes into a transmitter, which is an analog transmitter, which wobbles a big signal. And the more you wobble your big signal to get it around the world, the more electricity you've got to shove in. And the BBC, is, you know, the license fee is never enough as we know. Somebody looked at the bill and said, research department, make that bill smaller. And so we figured out that actually if you took the average sort of um, audio envelope, I think it was on a second basis or something like that, and you said, right, that is only ever going to go to 50% of peak modulation for these signals, then you can still get the signal all the way around the world. And for English, it was wonderful. 
However, not everybody in the world speaks English. <laughs> and we discovered that there were certain African languages and Chinese uh, variants that if you don't get the attack rate just right of certain bits of speech, it's unintelligible. Sounds like one of that BBC episode of that drama we won't talk about with the unintelligibility ratings were just horrible. So I was actually going to ask, well, either of our Fraunhofer experts, on these new super funky compression, super low bitrate stuff, how much of this kind of testing for different weird languages that aren't in involved in the research schemes, does, does that go on? Should it go on? Sure, sure. I mean, for, for, for AC and high efficiency AC, when it was used in, in, in um, the uh, <clears throat> mobile radio, mobile TV mm -hmm. in Japan, we had a special tuning on the encoder right. for the Japanese language. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> And does that go back into the standard, or does, does is no, Japanese it's a, AAC just a bit better? No, no, bit it's, 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 in the standard, normally you uh, standardize the bitstream and the decoder. Right. And the encoder tuning is not standardized. Oh, so encoding's an art form, decoding's a. Yeah, form. because <laughs> you always go with improvements on the encoder side. You never right. can keep up with the standardization. Gotcha. Okay. Good. We saved a lot of money, and the Chinese were happy. I think that's <laughs> the right word. <laughs> Yeah, and well, I mean, that's, this is one of the things that we will we'll touch on the, you know, the, the unique ways of uh, of using audio um, <laughs> are are interesting. But I mean, over the years, Bruce, you must have um, dealt with far too many uh, codecs. Um, yes. You know, we we've obviously come a long way. Um, do you feel like we've solved most of those problems? You know, there used to be quality you had to fight for to compression, uh, sorry, in computation and, and bit rate. Now. Thanks to uh, the latest AAC, it feels like you know there's there's no more competition uh, well, left. Well, yes and no. But as my colleagues at AWS or Azure will tell me, oh, computing and storage are cheap. But when the monthly bill comes around, you think, well, if I could just make it a bit smaller <laughs> and do a little bit, little fewer sums, actually, I could put more bread on the table. That would be nice. So um, everyone wants the smallest, most perfect file but they don't want any inconvenience as a result. So one of the, the major issues that we had designing the MXF file format, and for those of you who haven't endured that pain, basically we were trying to document all the workflows that had ever taken place since about 1940 and digitize them and write them down and call it MXF. That's really what the process was. And we discovered, particularly with AAC, for example, that the decision which was great for audio to have an atomic indivisible unit of 24 milliseconds, I think it is, of audio is great. But if only that lined up with the video frames, that would have allowed a dumb cut and being able to you know, chop your files just by truncating them dumbly. Mm -hmm. But because you can't do that, truncating an audio video interleave file using no intelligence is actually a difficult thing to do because you always end up with a bit of dangling forward or dangling backward stuff. No longer. No, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Coming to that, so back in the day, we tried to fix it at the file-based level, and that was oh so ugly, um, because what we discovered is if you did really dumb cuts in dumb editors, uh, they were the best editors in the world at the time, and I'm not going to name brands, but give me a, buy me a drink later, and I'll tell you. Um, we discovered that if you had a very, very long movie, like, you know, apparently people make movies that are more than three hours long, and you accumulate these little rounding errors of the audio video delays, you can end up with the audio out by two or three seconds by the end, depending on which device then tries to in engage those things because of the AAC. So at the time, what most people did is AAC was decoded, linear PCM audio, and then off you go again. And that mental trauma, I think, still lives with a lot of people in the industry. And we find workflows that could be super efficient using the latest codex, because they were like bitten 15 years ago, like, whoa, oh, we're not going there. Even if the junior comes along and says, but it works. The old guy with the gray hair and the sour face goes, no, you know what, it didn't work then. I don't believe it's going to work now. And I think we've done this to ourselves too many times in the industry, where we've got a great audio solution or a great video solution developed not quite in isolation, but almost. And as soon as you put them together in real world practical applications, somebody suffers. And I'd really like to think that as we move into the future and we do really funky things like object-based media, we think about that before we commit to shooting ourselves in both feet with both barrels of the shotgun. Again. <laughs> before we come on to object-based media specifically, Anne, I was going to ask you, um, one of the things that I think we're always aware of is the, you know, how well 
people are receiving our media. Mm -hmm. um, and being a kind of a, a broadcast convention conference, you know, typically we would expect and think uh, linearly in terms of radio and in terms of TV. Um, how is how is um, radio doing, um, perhaps from a UK perspective or otherwise, in terms of you know, who's listening and, and is, it, is it going up, is it going down? Are we, you know, is this a TikTok fight or um, you know, is there good news somewhere? Well, so I think there is, uh, the radio industry, there's always a bit of a joke, especially in the UK, that we really love to be very depressed and say, oh, the world's ending, you know, it's terrible. Younger audiences aren't listening. And that there is a reduction in the number of young people listening to, to live broadcast. But we still have in the UK 89% of the population tuning into radio each week. We're bigger the in, than the internet and bigger than television. Um, I think there's less of a divide on the, on the terms of the, I hate the word brands, but, you know, the stations or the producers' point of view in terms of radio versus audio and on-demand and podcasting and social media content because you're producing all of those nowadays. Mm -hmm. And there are even radio stations in the UK now that are um, broadcasting on television as well or are visualising a huge amount of their content. So there is much more of a convergence of the two, although, of course, radio and television are, are separate mediums but there's mm -hmm. a lot of overlap in what people working at radio stations in the editorial or technical capacity are having to think about mm -hmm. so yes we have to be we're always worried about the future um of course we are but it doesn't mean to say that people aren't listening at the moment because they are yeah and, and to, to your point i guess the rise in, in podcasting uh over the last many years now is in, in some ways just provides another outlet for what would are otherwise radio programs? Yeah, and it's it's great news for speech producers, which is what yes. I was originally. <laughs> so, yeah, um, it's it's a slightly different story for people in the in the music world. But even we had the radio festival in the UK um, earlier this week or no, last week. It's Times IBC Time <laughs> turns us into a vortex, and even then, everybody, as per usual, there's a new technology coming along AI. So what do we do? We worry about it. <laughs> but then by the end of the afternoon, we were reminding ourselves that actually audiences still want a connection. They still want a human voice. They still want a friend. And so whether that's coming over radio or coming via a different method, we've yep. sat around the campfire and told stories, as my friend Dave Walters would always say, and we sing songs. And, you know, as he would say, that that's what we're always going to do. So kind of the technology will change and evolve over time, and that's fine. But creative people telling stories is mm -hmm. going to be with us until, you know, the planet burns and humankind dies out. So you've got to keep it positive. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So, look, we, what we do want to do, though, is, is to continue to innovate, continue to make um, radio listening and audio listening interesting and, and kind of match what the expectations are. So one of the things we'll talk about, Daniela, is, uh, is the idea of object-based media and object-based audio. I mean, to you, what does, that, what does that mean to you, either practically or in, in terms of the uh, things that you create? So for me, object-based audio has different features. My key feature always is the user interactivity because I give a lot of demos and I always experience that everybody wants to listen to content differently. So like, for example, imagine you're watching a sports broadcast of like a foot football game and then interactivity would mean you sit at home in front of your TV, have a remote control, can open up a menu and then select between different presets, for example, like the normal mix, or you could switch to a mix where the home crowd is enhanced because you're a fan of, of the home crowd and you want to listen to the fans screaming, that could be one feature. Or you could switch the language of the broadcast commentary. Or something I personally like to switch the broadcast commentary off because you think, oh, he's talking too much. I don't really like it. I just want to watch the game and listen to the atmosphere and maybe listen to the stadium commentary. So the person who's at the stadium and then you can increase the level of the stadium commentary, for example, or um, accessibility features mm -hmm. get like easier to use. For example, an audio description. You could add audio description, people who need it, can listen to it, and the others can just listen to their default mix. And also, I'm working on um, speech enhancement, which means that we allow a slider to increase the prominence of um, the dialogue. And yeah, all those features, it gets just easier to use, and it's such a nice idea to offer people different ways to listen or to watch, no, listen is the right word, to listen to um, content because yeah. we all 
have different needs. Mm -hmm. That's a fair point. I mean, Stefan, what's what's changed in in Codex that allows this to happen compared to uh, um, older Codex? As I, as I said before, what we had to was, was channels. Everything was mixed together, and there was no way to unbundle it again on the receiver side. With an advent of, of objects and the introduction of the system into the audio coding, we now have the possibility to use only objects, to use a mixture of objects and channels, which allows us to do a very effective mix. So for example, when we come back to the stadium in a sports event, <clears throat> you would quite often do the stadium atmosphere as a channel bed, which can be immersive with, with height speakers. And then all the additional things can be objects. So <clears throat> when the World Cup was transmitted in Brazil, uh, we worked with Globo at that time. And in Brazil, it's very important that you have a loud ball kick. <laughs> so we put in uh, the option for the user to enhance the ball kick sound or lower it, depending what you want, <laughs> which is <laughs> which is a small <laughs> thing, but for, for the user, it's a big difference because he enjoys the ball kick. Um, <clears throat> then, of course, what uh, mentioned already, to have different commentators, it's also something where you can introduce new sports into a country. So you have can have a, a commentator now, which is an object as the beginner's commentator, which explain all the rules, which would be very boring for the expert. <laughs> and then you have a second object, which is the um, <clears throat> commentator for the experts, which explains more the tactics and, and everything behind this, why they did it this way. And so it gives a lot of more flexibility to the user because you also can adopt uh, the volume of the commentators compared to the ambience. And since we can now seamlessly switch between the different situation, I mean, most people I learned when the Korean did some testing preferred to do it without commentator. But if there's a critical scene on the, on the uh, field, then you might want to listen to the commentator and the expert to get their opinion and then switch back without commentator. So that we can do this seamlessly was very important. <clears throat> and that we also solve the problem of uh, cutting in the area of uh, encoded <laughs> audio and video. <laughs> by aligning it to the, uh, to the video frames. <clears throat> that was also one, one important point. Interesting. Thank you, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> you we listen. One, Sometimes we listen. Take one of the rods out of my back and put it on the floor now. Thank you. <laughs> so, and what's your opinion on um, immersive audio for radio applications? Because it feels to me like it's not, not used. So specifically, just like surround sound, that type of immersive audio. So I think this is where it's an interesting thing around the discussion of object-based media, object-based audio, mm. surround sound, immersive audio, because the, in some ways, and I hate to say this, uh, television's been a little bit ahead. Oh, there we go. Um, but it has meant that there's been perhaps a bit of a focus in when it's being talked about uh, on a wider level. Oh, thank you. <laughs> go team. Um, on on live TV broadcasts, on sports broadcasts, and on um, things like immersive audio. And so that hasn't really been so much the conversation on the radio and podcast side, mm -hmm. although that is a use case that could be really useful. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I don't, I don't want to hijack your, your order, but I think there's much more we could be doing with it. Sure. And so th there's less of an awareness in the general production community around object-based media at all. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, if you talk to them about it, they've never heard of it. Yes. Um, and then if they have, if they're more of a sound engineer kind of background, then what they have heard of is um, things like immersive audio, mm. but they haven't thought about the much wider use cases and contexts. So, so there's lots of things we could do, but I think a lot of the opportunities actually come, first of all, from things like podcasting, being able to send stuff to um, headphones and smart speakers. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you know, Apple, for example, has got their posh, fancy, expensive, you know, uh, headphones. Uh, so I think there's going to be a, a lot more that we can be doing first in the podcasting on demand and then at the next stage, smart speaker stage, mm -hmm. um, before we start looking at the, the live broadcast, although it's all related, of course. Okay. So I think it, it, the, the, the beauty of the object-based audio is that it allows the receiver to recreate the audio for whatever you've got. Like we've got a few speakers here, we could have a different experience. Is that correct, Daniela, from compared in the, so if I've got my headphones on, I'm gonna to listen to something differently. Yes, exactly. So object-based audio is broadcast 
differently than ch channel-based audio. Um, the audio is separate from the metadata and then it gets rendered in the end device. So the end device has a decoder and it notices, for example, oh, the headphones are connected, so I will play it back binaurally if that's what um, mm -hmm. they want to select. Or there is a 5.1 plus 4 setup and then it just gets rendered to that setup. Okay. And I think that the headphone listening is really crucial, especially when it comes yeah. to podcasting, because we know that, I forget the statistic, but you know, a significant number of people, m most people who listen to podcasts are listening on a smartphone or mm -hmm. on a tablet, and of those, a significant number will be listening at various points on headphones. Yeah. And so it gives us a really good opportunity and a point of difference in our um, apps as well to say, hey, you know, don't just mm -hmm. listen to the generic podcast app. You must download, you know, insert <laughs> BBC Sounds or Global Player or whatever your radio station's app is. And then that could give you a, an advantage to listening okay. in that format because you're going to have a, an enhanced and a better alternative experience. Part of the master plan. <laughs> <laughs> so Bruce, Daniela mentioned your favorite word, metadata. Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit what, about what you've been showing at the IBC Accelerator? project and creating metadata and using that, please. Thank you. Um, yes, so we're trying to get a hyper-personalized viewing experience. Uh, so with the um, kind collaboration of the BBC, um, Infuse Video, who built the player, MetaRex, which is my metadata project, and a company called Kuvo, Customer Voice, and a DRM company, Easy DRM, we've basically taken an episode of Spring Watch, which is a nature documentary, and we've chopped it up into 167 tiny little segments, each of which have narrative importance. So if you play them all, one after the other, in order, you get the 55-minute program, and it's just what you expect. However, every one of these short segments has been tagged with two different AI engines and a human typing into a spreadsheet. And my little bit of the project is probably the most tedious and boring, where we magically turn all of that metadata um, through automation into a set of FFmpeg commands to actually make the clips from the original. But also all the normalized tags using the same vocabulary so that, you know, because none of these tools speak the same thing, and I'm going to ask you about tooling in a second. Um, so we, we need things to speak the same language so that the Infuse video player can present a coherent set of options for the viewer. So. That's lovely, but what do you end up with? Well, imagine that anybody who's f familiar with the BBC um, sort of uh, nature documentary uh, presenters, th there is a very strong following for some pr presenters, and I dare I say an anti-following for other presenters. And so particularly some of the members of my household would quite like to turn Michaela Strachan up to 12 um, and Chris Packen <laughs> down to minus one. Um, and so effectively, that's what we can do. You don't like that presenter, you need never see them at all, except for when it's funny and he's being covered in whale poo, allegedly. You have to come and see the demo. Um, so we can turn on and off things like presenters, but we can also make the viewing much more personalized. So if you don't like foxes crunching on baby chicks live on air, you can turn off death. <laughs> this happened, it was a live program. You can't control what the fox does. Um, but you can turn off all sorts of other things. And essentially, if, you know, you can imagine you, you're watching it with your, your, I don't know, your neighbors and your granny, for example, and suddenly the turns start to get a little bit jiggy with it, and they start to sort of move to each other and rub their bottoms together, and you know what's coming next. Wouldn't it be nice just to flick the no sex and violence, please, so that you don't have to watch live sex on the television with your neighbors trying desperately not to make eye contact with them, but to pretend, oh, well, that's a really good shot. Look at the lighting on that. That is just wonderful. <laughs> um, so flicking your finger, just turning that off, just saves all of that ugly embarrassment, and you can have dinner without having to be embarrassed. But one of the problems that we've got is the editorials who are making this for linear TV, they beautifully carried the music and the effects all the way over the video clips. There were lots of fades down and fades up, and it's an awful program to try and segment this way. So if there was object-based audio and all the effects are on one channel, then when we had to get rid of, for example, the, the Fox carnage scene, actually you couldn't really see anything. And if we just got rid of the effects at that point, it would just look like the fox snuffling in the ground, and you'd never know that two little chicks lost their lives. And that would have been a much better narrative, and also the nice music that was playing, you wouldn't have had to miss that nice little twiddly bit at the end. So I think object-based media is not just for sort of, you know, um, looking in the dimension of which channels do I select for my languages and who's doing it, but it's also helping with the story narrative. Because the most interesting thing that we've done is we work with the editorial team to say, for each one of these segments, 
if this feels like you know a 100% must show segment, and this one's like a 1%, well, you can jettison that one and the story arc still works. We can now create a dial where if you turn it all the way to the right, you see the full program, and you turn it all the way to the left, and you get the six minute program, or the three minute trailer, or the 30 second trailer. So now what we can do is you come home from work, you've got 15 minutes to sit down before the school bus arrives, and it's like, well, I've got 15 minutes to watch this 55 minute program, set your dial to 15 minutes, turn Chris Packham off, press play, and you've got the perfect program. And for some reason, people think this is kind of funky. <laughs> I think it's a really good way of um, uh, enabling people to watch programming on their terms. But as you say, you know, as long as you have that connection with the editorial team, yep. then in due course, people won't feel that their toes have been sure. trodden on too much. I was going to ask Daniela, you know, what, what sort of tooling do the creators and producers and editors actually have? Is it all sort of alpha generation stuff at the moment? Do, do they have to have a different experience when doing an object mix compared to a traditional mix? I don't think so. Okay. I think it always sounds more complicated than it is for the producer <laughs> because you just you can do the mix the way you're used to it. You just have to use one more tool, for example. And the step we call authoring, it means enabling the metadata. It's not that complicated. And everyone who's interested, we have a demo <laughs> here at IBC. You can just come by, I'll explain to you. But basically, for example, you're in Pro Tools. It's like the standard DAW, digital audio workstation. And you insert a plugin. And then you say, this 5.1 plus 4 mix is the bad. And uh, this is the English commentary, the German commentary, and the audio description. You just send everything into the plugin, tag the metadata, create a default preset or a speech enhancement preset, and then export it. So it's maybe, I don't know, if you spend 30 minutes, I think you'll get the hang of it. And the longer you do it, the easier it gets. But it's not very complicated. So that sounds like a challenge one I'll endeavor to do. <laughs> <laughs> Come by. I will. I want to t tackle this, um, what I feel is a little bit of a um, uh, contradiction because we want to have more personalization and it makes a lot of sense. Um, but I recall that uh, using DAB, you can turn on or you turn off dynamic range compression. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, as far as I'm concerned, people probably just leave it off and most people don't know it's there. But it's a really good idea to make things easier to understand in the car. So you mentioned um, in AAC now there's mandatory loudness and, and uh, dynamic range compression indicators. So, you know, how, how do we, how, have we learned anything in terms of making that something that people will use or can benefit from rather than just too complex? <laughs> So it's always better to do it automatically without any user interference. <laughs> <laughs> so um, nowadays, a lot of people are listening to radio and podcasts on mobile devices. Mm -hmm. So you have a microphone. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you could use a microphone to measure the environment, if it's a noise environment or not. And then you can set the right DSE profile to have still the best possible intelligibility of your voice spoken word. <clears throat> so that is one possibility we have nowadays, which we didn't have at that time because no radio had a microphone at that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we had to set manually to the right one. <clears throat> and um, with the automatic loudness <clears throat> we, we have built in, you can have a stream with a lot of loudness, dynamic range in it. And um, so depending on the receiving device, if you have a home stereo at home, you can have a higher dynamic range as if you would use it maybe in a car or in, in a mobile device. So the decoder knows in which device he's built in, so he can automatically then adapt the audio to the right uh, output. Okay. Yeah, I think that's, that's a very good idea in terms of, the, uh, of having something that's automatic or at least a bit like an accessibility feature. Perhaps you set it once and then you don't have to think about it too much. But um, without a doubt, more personalization in the style that um, Bruce is talking about is, is, is it's not just um, something which I think people will benefit from, but it's a way of, as you say, turning it down to 30 seconds, okay? Yeah. It might annoy some of the presenters, but you know <laughs> that, that's a way of generating a short piece of content that a lot of people would like. So, and you're passionate about object-based media. Yep. And um, <laughs> so I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are in terms of moving forward because um, We've seen, and partly through um, some of the partners within the IBC Accelerator project, that there's some object-based media being used in, in real life, but it also feels like 
there isn't. <laughs> yes. yes. So, just that, that, you... that is exactly the point. So um, we've been in an interesting position where I've been, I think, probably like a lot of us, sort of knocking around the object-based media space for about 10 years, but so have lots of people, and they've been doing all sorts of interesting things. So we've had people like Fraunhofer and... There's, a, there's another company that does some stuff in Swan Sand. Well. Um, <laughs> and uh, lots of research projects the U, at the EBU, the European Broadcasting Union, have been doing things. There was the Orpheus project. The BBC has been doing lots of things. I was a little bit involved in the Internet Fit Studios work. Um, my friends who are researchers, um, like Dr. Lauren Ward, Mariana Lopez, have been doing all kinds of different projects, looking at different use cases. And so we've had... 10 years or so, I appreciate that Fraunhofer has got a, a thing that's actually in the real world now. So, uh, but we've had 10 years or so of people proving a concept. They'll do a trial of something to go, there's this really cool thing we could do with object-based media. And in order to demonstrate it, I will build a slightly wonky test tool. And then I'll run the thing and I'll talk about it. And everyone will go, oh, that's brilliant. But obviously, you don't have to then think about the real world implications of what you're going to do. And we've had a lot of time of getting people excited about the idea, but we're no further forward really in terms of having it as part of our actual practical workflow. And some of that's around producers just not being aware that it's a thing, and then it's also that it's just not available for listeners and for our audiences to easily be able to, to see and play back. So what we need to do, I'm very grateful that there are people who are doing this really detailed work, the audio definition model, all of those things, and they're looking at it in extraordinary depth. But we actually need to pull right back and start focusing on some very fast use cases that are actually going to be useful and revolutionary. So things like um, being able to have the adjustment for accessibility or if you're in a noisy area. So there have been trials of that in uh, the television program in the UK called Casualty, which is based around an emergency room. And uh, you were able to have a preset to have the mix that the um, was the original intent of the production team. And then you could have it, re so some of the background noise was reduced, and then another version where a lot was reduced. But the important thing is producers have to be involved in this stuff. So if you start talking about tons and tons of micro adjustments that might happen automatically, they will be nervous to begin with. You need to reassure them that it's all about their creativity. So in the auto, in the environment when you're taking out unnecessary noise, in a drama, we still need to keep the noise that's narratively important. If you have a, a, a hospital drama and a patient has a machine that's going beep, 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 because they're about to die and they need the paddles putting on them, we need to hear that. We can't have that noise ducked. So what we need to do is to be able to have a fast workflow that uses the tools people already have, because we're not going to go and sell them lots of new things all the time. So to be able to have an agreed set of markers and metadata um, labels and tags, we love metadata, mm -hmm. so that we can have a, a, a neutral set of those that are open source that you can put into any audio or video editor as kind of phase one of the and master plan. Um, mm -hmm. So that people can go in if they're producing, tag up chunks of the show that can stand alone, chunks of the show that could be skipped, chunks of the show that are less important, prioritize their audio tracks by whether the sound could be ducked or you know tag a, a, an item to say this is narratively important. Put those building blocks together and start training and teaching and showing people the ways that object-based could be useful for their production. So some of the workflows in object-based media that are useful might be things that are internal to your organization that never that never see an audience. It might be that you decide to trans, um, transcript every audio track and you use that to make your archive easier. It's easier to find the material when a famous person dies and you can go through the obit because you have a transcription of everything in your, in your database. Like that's a useful thing. You could then look at, oh, we could turn that into subtitles or we could turn that into a way to let an AI bot translate our lovely program into Spanish automatically. You could do that, but there's a lot we can do internally to make our production processes quicker. So what we need to do is to get together, um, I'm hoping to create a neutral industry um, championing body uh, where we can bring together all the work that people are doing and come up with some fast actions to produce some some guidelines. Standard is a strong word, maybe not a standard. Um, uh, so that manufacturers can put some of these tags in and then we can put those equivalent tags into our playback devices so that we can have um, swappable objects there is a, a, the BBC did a trial recently where you could have a slightly different version of the programme playing depending on what, where your phone was and what it was doing. So think about that for a, 
a radio show or a television show, perhaps you have a chunk of the programme that's about an amazing competition um, to win a, you know, a, a car or whatever. And if you listen to that programme before the 31st of August, you're going to get all the information about the contest. And if you listen after, maybe you don't have that object or maybe you have another object saying, well, the competition's now closed and congratulations to Bruce for winning the car. And, you know, like, do keep listening to wonderful, you know, IBC FM because, we, you know, next week we've got the competition to win the uh, round the world trip or whatever. So there's a lot of real world use cases that can be useful today. And we, we just need to do the work to bring together all the incredible work that people are doing so that it's actually useful in the real world. So that's that's what I have decided is my mission because <laughs> someone's got to do it. Working together <laughs> is always the solution. So, you know, yeah. it's very interesting. And, and uh, yeah, I think standard with a small s is, is an okay thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> it's been um, lovely talking here. Um, we've got, uh, we've we finished with Bruce winning a car and the launch of IBC FM. Yeah. So <laughs> I think that's very successful. So it just remains, and I'd like you to um, put your hands together to thank uh, Stefan, Bruce, uh, Daniela, and of course, um, Anne to, for joining me today. And thank you for being here. Thank you, Russell.